Across Karamoja's sprawling mines are labor camps where locals spend days hacking at the earth tucked away beneath the emerald hills and rugged landscape. Scores of men, women and children inside the bowels of the earth dig the surface without any protective gear. Across the pits is a life of ruin and misery that has left its victims in a state of squalor and despair. For the paltry salary they work for, they can barely save any money. Those providing cheap labor are unaware that there's a scramble for mineral wealth worth billions of shillings led by multinational corporation Capital. In every pocket of Karamoja there are minerals where artisanal miners trap nuggets of gold. It's not clear yet how much wealth is buried in the grounds of Karamoja. An aeromagnetic survey, what we would call aerial survey of the rest of Uganda, 80% save for Karamoja because the security pertaining at that time wouldn't allow us to get financing, wouldn't allow to get insurers because these aircrafts must be insured to be able to undertake this activity. So, Karamoja was not surveyed. So in that regard, the potential of Karamoja has not been well known. But uh, luckily for us now, we have found funding from the Spanish government, uh, who have come with an exporter who will do the work from Spain, a company from Spain as well, because this is concessional funding from Karamoja. And that, when that is done, uh, we think it should be kicking off any time now, we will get to understand the potential of Karamoja. Perhaps this is what prompted Cabinet to approve recently an airborne geological and geophysical survey mapping Karamoja which will cost an astronomical 20 million euros equivalent to 84 billion shillings. NTV has learned that the cost of the airborne geological survey is now contested. This is after Whistleblower authored a report which shows huge disparities in the cost of the airborne survey as the taxpayer stands to lose about 60 billion shillings. It's common practice that such contracts in Uganda are usually at the behest of commission agents who inflate costs. According to the Whistleblower report, a Spanish firm Excalibur proposed to carry out an airborne survey for Karamoja subregion at the price of 20 million euros or the equivalent, which is about 84 billion shillings. Another 12 billion shillings was included in the budgetary allocation for the financial year 2019-2020 for the airborne survey, bringing the total cost to 96 billion shillings. A British firm, SRKES, offered to carry out the airborne geological survey at a much cheaper price at the cost of 9.6 million US dollars, equivalent to 36 billion shillings. According to the whistleblower, the British firm made a technical presentation to the Directorate of Geological Survey and Mines at their offices in Entebbe on 13th March 2019. On 23rd July 2019, the Secretary to the Treasury, Keith Mwakanizi, authored a letter in response to the whistleblower's report addressed to the Finance Ministry. The ministry is in receipt of a confidential report from the whistleblower indicating that the current estimated cost approved by cabinet is exaggerated by 60 billion shillings. The report further indicates that your ministry refused to consider a proposal from another company which would carry out the same activities at a cost of $9.6 million compared to $20.6 million estimated by Excalibur, I close quotes, reads Mohakanizi's letter. Mohakanizi implores the ministry to explain the difference in cost for the project as alleged by the whistleblower and provide assurance that there's no unjustified cause for the ministry not to proceed with Excalibur. If 60 billion shillings were to be saved in the coffers, it could build dams and silos to store foodstuff and save scores from capitulating to a slow and agonizing death as a result of starvation. Mining activities have caused massive environmental destruction that poses an existential threat to the locals. But for the majority of the Karamajong who are illiterate, they can't foretell that their communities are in the throes of a mineral scramble as trucks carrying minerals burrow past them.
the spaces of their crumbling manyatas continue to narrow. But those seeking a fortune gaze down from the crest of hills in Karamoja in admiration of the vast expanse. For one to understand the scramble, they ought to look at companies prospecting for minerals and to examine the Karamoja concessions list as of April 2018. Scores of farms by then had acquired exploration licenses, location licenses and mining leases, some of which have expired. By totaling up the number of square kilometers allocated for these licenses, I was able to estimate that about 3.7 million acres had been parceled out for these mining activities. An acre is equivalent to a football pitch. When we learned that almost 90% of Karamoja land has been apportioned by investors, even without the knowledge and you know, contribution of the will of the people. And I know, for example, of an investor who has the entire sub-county, a sub-county of Rupa, all in his hands, without considering the settlement, without considering the, the infrastructure that is there, health centers, education centers, and so on. This person owns that land practically, but the people were never, never at one moment consulted. This, I think, is not fair, and government should come in and enforce that the principle should be before you even acquire any level of license, you must have got clearance from the community. This is a little dangerous because it, it looks like a form of land grabbing. A form of land grabbing whereby they come in, a, in the name of mining, then later they say they have acquired the land. But as I said earlier on, the investors are not by law allowed to buy land. They are supposed to be leased the land. After a certain period of their exploration, they quit the land, the land remains to the, the landowners. It appears there is some kind of uh, mis, uh, a kind of a, a way some investors are coming to acquire land in the name of minerals. But the people of Karamoja are now alert. That's why you've heard of so many land-related conflicts and disputes. There was an investor, actually an Indian of origin, who uh, went to the president and said he wanted to develop the limestone in Karamoja. And so he was given the freedom to go there and negotiate and find a way of putting a factory in Karamoja to process the limestone. But what happened? When this guy went there, instead of concentrating on limestone, for which he was cleared, he realized that there was a precious thing, again, which is called marble. And the guy started ferrying these things, coming to chop them in, 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 in Busoga here, and ferrying you know, blocks of, of, of marble. There we went off, and we said, no, that's not fair. Now I'm told he was exporting, but we have stopped that ever since. For locals whose main source of living is nomadic pastoralism, this means that large chunks of their land, including grazing and water sources, has been fenced off to allow mining activities. Speculators have also rushed to Karamoja, acquiring licenses on behalf of their puppet masters, which they later sell for a fee to investors. It's not clear yet why there isn't any stringent due diligence carried out before one can be issued a license. The issue, the issue of lances is not even in conformity with the law. Uh, take for example, um, an investor is, is issued a lances here without the consultation of the local communities. He goes straight and he wants to access the site. Now, when he goes straight to access the site, the people resist. A case in Rupa for Dao Mabo. 
where people resisted because they were not consulted, they were not involved in the whole process, is because the ministry does the ministry does their own things, yeah, without involving the local governments and the grassroots communities. And so this has been a challenge for Karamoja and I think the entire the entire country. And uh, in the current review of the mineral policies, we want to see that, that the communities, the lower local governments, are fully involved and they consent. We are not refusing for investors to come and... and for instance, these are some of the requirements for acquiring a prospective license, a valid ID, including a passport, driving permit or national ID, a field form 1A of the Mining Regulations 2004, payment of 500,000 shillings as statutory fee, a certified copy of Articles of Association and Memorandum of Association Stroke Constitution, a field form of the Mining Regulations 2004. And these are the requirements for an exploration license, 500,000 shillings as registration fees, 1 million shillings as application fees, 2 million shillings for preparation for renewal of an exploration license, 50,000 shillings per square meter as mineral rent annually, 75,000 shillings per square meter as mineral rent annually for first renewal, 100,000 shillings per square meter as mineral rent annually for second renewal, 300,000 shillings for gazetting the grant of an exploration license. Without stringent rules in place, the Energy Ministry is planning to introduce a raft of changes to tighten the licensing process. All the systems now are going to be run on an online registration system. The licenses will be applied for, the required fees are paid for everything online, and even license management will be online. In other words, by click of, 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 the, of, the, of the pen, of, 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 the, of the button, we'll be able to know that license X was required, is required to submit a given report at certain certain time. The license X is meant to pay their annual fees. Because right now what we are suffering is that many people have defaulted on their annual fees, on reporting. That will go away when this system is launched. And, we, and we've been advertising that by the end of this month, everybody must trans form and go on that system. So we think that it will harmonize and bring sanity into, this, into, into the sector. For instance, Oli Gold Muruli is owned by John Muruli, John Muyambi and Patricia Gold M. Churiachi Rakaro, who are both students. It was given an exploration license in 2015 for base metals, gold, rare earth elements, uranium and platinum group metals. The license expired on January 13th, 2018. It's not clear yet whether it was renewed. Among us, those who have acquired several exploration licenses and mining leases is Pastor Samuel Kakande of Synagogue Church of All Nations and his protege, Pastor John Muanguzi Kato. Kakande owns 80% stake in Mechanized Agro Uganda Limited, while Johnson Muanguzi owns 100% in his mining farm. Among us, the minerals they are prospecting for include base metals, dimension stone, platinum group metals, precious metals, rare earth metals, and uranium. Every Ugandan, every individual who has the right credentials, financial, technical, can apply for a license. What you wouldn't want to do is for people who have prior information, like me who works in the sector, like anybody who works in the sector, a minister who works in the sector to apply for a license. But a pastor, why not? He's a Ugandan. Um, I, I, I want to think that a minister in, in some other ministry who has no prior information could also apply. But Ethics Minister Father Simon Lokodo, who has previously owned an exploration license for base metals and gold, says a commission of inquiry should be sanctioned to establish the truth about opaque mining activities in Karamoja. Government should come in and establish who is this that has usurped the rights and privileges of the people in Karamoja. And such people should be really brought to book 
or even altogether deprived of those rights. Those licenses should be just cancelled to allow the people to enjoy what God has given them as an heritage. But for now, it's commonplace for locals to find strangers exploring their land for minerals. Many have taken advantage of the sleepingness of the Karamojong. And as I've just told you, a whole sub-county of Rupa, a whole sub-county of Namaru is in an investor's names. So people are there as quarters in their own credo land. The law says the local communities should be involved. There must be a consent of the local communities. And all along since 2002 up to date, there is no clear working model between even the local governments of Moroto and the lower local governments of the area where the, the minerals is being uh, mined. And, and this has been a big challenge to me as, as a leader. I've been pushing on to ensure that the people benefit because if there was a fair way of doing things, the poverty levels in the region would have really um, it would have improved in our incomes in, uh, in tackling the poverty levels. I think uh, they can do online licensing because of technology, but uh, we can't run away from the technology. But uh, there must be strategic processes of making sure that that information is first of all accessible to all of us, that uh, there has been a systematic consultation and feedback to the communities where these resources, or feedback to the communities who are going to be affected by an agreement, by a transaction which is going to be executed between the companies and government. What will be left of the once beautiful landscape where men returned their cattle to the kraals and reclined on hairdressed stools to share folk stories at the fireplace? With the mining industry clocked in secrecy and the locals being subjected to the most egregious forms of labor exploitation, Karamoja is a desolate land pockmarked with pits and debris. Emmanuel Mutaizewa, NTV.